you and I are going to endure in the Christian race, especially in times of trial, we need to be those who prize our inheritance in Christ above all other things. We need to guard our hearts especially carefully in days when we are feeling weary in the race. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Today we continue to look at this topic of endurance. And uh, if we are going to endure and endure well, Jonathan, as you point out, one of the things we need to do is to guard our hearts. But what does that mean to guard your heart? One thing we discover as we go along in the Christian life, and one thing I think we see very clearly in the Word, is that times of trial and difficulty, which we will all face, those times can be real real turning points in faith, and they can be real danger zones. You know, whenever we face trial, suffering, difficulty, we can either allow ourselves to drift off course spiritually— uh, the writer of Hebrews actually uses the image of a, of a racetrack, of an Olympic racetrack, and, and we can drift off the paved track, the safe track, and get into rocky territory, and we can, we can turn an angle, we can become lame in the race, and, and Hebrews talks about that danger. Or we can, face, we can face trial, and in the midst of that trial, look to the Lord— submit ourselves to what he is doing in our lives. We recognize that he hasn't lost control, but he's doing something in the midst of this. And we, we say, Lord, I, I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you, and I'm going to walk with you through this. And that can actually be then a time of growth, and it spurs us on in the race. There are key moments in the Christian life, and Hebrews wants to teach us and to encourage us to respond rightly to trial and to use those times for growth, for forward movement, not not to go off track and become disabled spiritually. Well, we're going to continue to look at this from the book of Hebrews. We are in chapter 12, so grab a Bible and uh, join us there if you haven't already as we continue our message called Endurance. Here is Jonathan. God's goal for us in his discipline of us is not that we would impress the neighbors with our outstanding and impeccable manners It's not that we would impress the teachers at school with our flawless study habits. No, God's goal for us in discipline is that we would grow in holiness. It's sometimes been said that God cares more about our holiness than our happiness. And sometimes, hard as it may seem to us, he allows us to go through some very unhappy times, some grievous times, that we might ultimately grow in holiness. That's, that's not a pleasant thing. That's not an easy thing. But the Bible never said that life as a Christian was going to be easy. Verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You know, God could spare us every trial that comes our way. He could smooth the path of life before us to make it pain-free, opposition-free, illness-free, conflict-free, pandemic-free, suffering-free. He could do that. But as a wise and a loving father who cares most about our holiness, most about that peaceful fruit of righteousness in our lives, he sometimes in his wisdom calls us to go through seasons of deep trial. And he does that for our good. Now that raises some questions for us. Questions for which I I don't have a conclusive answer, I'll say right now. Questions like these. We we might ask, is every trial a form of training, discipline, in the sense that we've been talking about? How do I know if God is using a particular trial to address a specific sin in my life, to, to lead me to greater holiness in a particular area? We might ask those questions. I don't think we necessarily have a clear answer for them in every way. It's clear from the Bible that we mustn't presume that suffering is due to a particular sin. That's a very important thing to recognize. Let me say it again. It's clear from the Bible we must not presume that all suffering is due to a particular sin in our lives. You may remember that uh, in John chapter 9, Jesus saw a man who had been born blind 
And his disciples said to him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born like this, that he should be born blind? That was their assumption. There's been some sin here that is in a direct way leading to this suffering. If there is suffering, there must have been sin. But Jesus, he he rejects their reading of the situation. And he says instead, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. You know, God has purposes that you and I don't know. But we mustn't assume that suffering is a direct result of a particular wrongdoing. That's an important point to register. But I take it from Hebrews chapter 12, from the verses we're considering here. I take it that it's healthy for us. Whenever we go through trial or difficulty, it's healthy to ask this question. What might my loving Heavenly Father be teaching me through this? Is there an area of my life where he is maturing me and causing me to grow? Is there perhaps an area of sin that, yes, he would call me to repent of? Is there an area of holiness in which he is nudging me to grow and move forward? What should I be learning in this season? That's a good question to ask. It's never wrong to ask those questions in a season of trial. And I believe it's always beneficial. And of course, if you and I have been walking with the Lord Jesus for any length of time, we're going to be able to attest to the fact that our Christian growth has often moved forward more rapidly in times of difficulty than in times of ease. Haven't you found that? We tend to learn more about holiness through our tears than through our laughter. So often it is the deepest trials in the Christian life that yield the richest fruit over time. And so how do we respond to our loving Father in times of trial? We we recognize his loving hand even in the darkest of times. In verse 9, we submit to him. We make ourselves willingly and trustingly and joyfully subject to him and to his wise purposes. How do we endure in times of trial? We submit to God's training and next we choose the straight path, verse 12. Therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather healed. We return here to imagery from last week, the image, verse 1, of a runner on a track. We're in the midst of a long marathon in the Christian life, the long run to heaven itself. We've been through some rough terrain. We've been through those seasons of trial and opposition and difficulty, and now we're tired. We're feeling the strain. We're worn out. We're frankly a bit bruised and battered. Everything aches. We've sustained some minor injuries along the way. Our hands, verse 12, are now drooping as we run. Our knees, they feel weak. And rather than running in a straight line, we're we're drifting from the center of the track as a tired runner often does. Remember, this track is a straight track aiming directly for the joyful destination of our salvation. Heaven is before us. Jesus is at the finish line. And we need to keep going straight ahead, not drifting off course by any degree. And the writer knows that off of the side of the track, there is rocky and dangerous ground. He knows that if we deviate off course at all, we're going to find ourselves running on ground that is bound to cause us injury. The the sore ankle will, will quickly become the broken and turned ankle if we go there. That's the danger he sees in verse 13. He's concerned that what is lame should not be put fully out of joint. Now, why is he saying this? What, what's his point? What would it look like to drift off the track when we are weary in the race? Well, I think it looks simply like falling into sin. Notice how he continues to unwrap this idea in verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 
when we're weary in the race, perhaps having faced a draining time of trial and of challenge, when that happens, I think we are more prone to sin. We're prone, aren't we, to being short-tempered, ungracious with others, not least other believers around us. We're prone to set aside holiness in favor of self-indulgence. You see, trial and challenge in the long Christian race can either make us spiritually or it can break us. And the writer wants us to come out of these challenging times with a new resolve to run harder and to run straighter in the middle of that track that goes straight to heaven. But we have to choose. Will we nurse our injuries? Will we fall into self-pity and self-indulgence? Will we take it out on others? Will we forget the call to be holy? Will we drift onto that rocky ground? Or will we stay in the middle of that track with our eyes set on the prize? I think this is a very good question actually to ask ourselves in this particular time of trial. It's a challenging time for everyone. And as believers, we have the assurance that God is going to use it for our training and for our good. But as we're weary, we need to ask ourselves, how are we going to react? Will we begin to feel sorry for ourselves? Will we begin to take it out on others and abandon the pursuit of peace in our relationships? Will we abandon the pursuit of godliness and decide instead to allow for self-indulgence of some kind or other. Because after all, we're having such a hard time of it anyway. Lift your drooping hands. Strengthen your weak knees, says the writer. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Endurance, part of our series from the book of Hebrews called So Great a Salvation. And if you've missed any of the broadcasts in this series or you want to go back and listen again, you can do that at our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, do you ever wonder about proof? Proof that Jesus of Nazareth really is the Son of God. In his book, The Case for Christ, Lee Strobel, who was a former legal editor for the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times, he retraces his own spiritual journey from atheism to faith, and he builds a captivating case for Christ's divinity. We'd love to send you a copy of this book, The Case for Christ, as our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message, here's Jonathan. How do we endure under trial? Choose the straight path and finally treasure your inheritance, verse 15. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. The story of Esau is a tragic and a cautionary tale. Esau, you may remember, was the eldest son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. This was a special family to be born into. God had given covenant promises to Abraham and to his family line, promising to bless this family in a very special way and to make them, in turn, a blessing to the world. As the eldest son of Abraham's son, Esau, he held the title deeds to the covenant promises of God. He, he held the title deeds to the salvation promises that had been made to the great patriarch of Israel, to Abraham himself. Esau was a twin born just ahead of his brother Jacob, who came into the world grabbing the heel of his elder brother. Now Esau, the Bible tells us, he was kind of a man's man. <laughs> he liked hunting and he liked the outdoors. And the Bible tells us as well that he was exceptionally hairy. Um, Jacob, on the other hand, he, he was a quiet man. We're told he was something of a schemer, evidently, a bit calculating, a bit ambitious. One day when Esau was out hunting, Jacob, he stayed at home and did some cooking instead. When Esau got back home from the hunt, starving and exhausted, he, he smelled the stew. 
and he asked for some, Jacob saw his opportunity right away. Sell me your birthright now, he demanded. You can absolutely have some of the stew, my brother. On one condition, you sell me that birthright as the eldest son. Well, driven by his physical appetite and not by his faith in God or his basic intellectual reasoning, for that matter, Esau declared, I'm about to die. I'm so hungry. What use is that birthright to me anyway? And so he gave away the most precious birthright in the whole world for a single bowl of stew. I don't know if you've ever observed someone who has despised their inheritance. Maybe someone who, I don't know, inherited a, a cherished family home. Been in the family for a long time, but they didn't want it. They just sold it as quickly as they could for whatever they could get for it. Someone who inherited a business that their parents or grandparents had built from scratch, a good business over the, over the decades. And, you know, they just let it fizzle because they had no interest and they couldn't really be bothered. Maybe someone who had a, a great family heritage of some other kind, a heritage of faith or a heritage of service to the community, but, you know, they had no interest. They didn't pursue it and they just let the memory fade. Esau was one who despised his inheritance. It meant absolutely nothing to him. The writer introduces the admonition not to be like Esau by telling us, verse 15, not to fail to obtain the grace of God, the promises of God, the salvation of God. And then he says to see to it that no root of bitterness springs up. Now, those words, root of bitterness, are in quotation marks in our Bibles because they come from the Old Testament and from the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, the Lord gives Moses to say to the uh, people of Israel at a time of covenant renewal. And just notice how Hebrews is referring back to this, Deuteronomy 29 and verse 18. Beware lest there be among you a man or a woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of the nations. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit, one who when he hears the words of this sworn covenant blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall be safe enough though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. What is the bitter root in these verses, it is quite simply the idolater who runs after the gods of the nations, after false gods, abandoning the true and the living God. Now, why does Hebrews quote those words before speaking of Esau and his great folly? Think again about what Esau did. He had in his hand the very covenant promises of God, the salvation promises of God, the birthright as Abraham's heir. And when he is offered a thing to satisfy his immediate physical appetite, he trades in the covenant promises of God for this thing of little value. You see, that's idolatry. Esau was an idolater, plain and simple. He preferred things over God and his promises. That's also what I think is behind this rather perplexing mention of him as being, verse 16, sexually immoral. We don't have much record of Esau being sexually immoral in the Old Testament per se. The closest thing we get is that he married a non-Israelite woman, which was a serious act of disobedience to the Lord. But he hardly had a marked biblical reputation uh, for sexual sin. However, the word sexually immoral, it, it refers to unfaithfulness or ungodliness in connection with, with marriage. And the Bible speaks many times of God's people being bound to him in a marriage-like relationship, a covenant relationship. God is the husband of his people. And Esau, in a variety of ways, he was unfaithful to the Lord, the husband of Israel. Here is a man who despised his inheritance who chose a cheap and a worthless thing instead of God himself. Here is a man who is rightly described, verse 16, as unholy. If you and I are going to endure in the Christian race, especially in times of trial and times of difficulty, we need to be those who prize our inheritance in Christ above all other things. 
We, we need to guard our heart against the danger of spiritual unfaithfulness, against the danger of God replacements in our lives. We need to guard our hearts against the danger of idolatry. And I think we need to guard our hearts, especially in times of trial and times of testing. We need to guard our hearts, especially carefully in days when we are feeling weary in the race. It's so interesting, isn't it, how easily Esau was tempted. Notice all it took for him, fatigue and hunger, and he was willing to throw it all away. How about us? How about you? How about me in the midst of this very trying time, facing weariness in isolation? We're weary of that, aren't we? Facing frustration at our present limitations, we're feeling frustrated. For some, facing the burdens of illness, financial pressure, grief. And when those things and others come, when the pressure rises, when the weariness sets in, the danger for us is that we might devalue the promises of God, our heavenly inheritance in Christ, and we might begin to set our sights on the things of this world that promise to bring us quicker satisfaction than the salvation promises of God. I wonder what are those things that you might turn to for satisfaction and for fulfillment in the here and now in place of trusting in the promises of God and persevering in holiness toward the prize that he has set before us. Maybe in this context, it's as simple as satisfying physical appetites in ways that aren't godly. You know, maybe your danger is, is, is simply of, of, of self-indulgence with food. Maybe your danger is gluttony, a bit of COVID comfort eating. Maybe that's what's going on with you. Maybe your danger is of sexual immorality of some kind. Maybe it's allowing love of possessions or the drive of ambition to fill your heart. In these strange days, you're thinking more and more about acquiring things or rising higher and higher in the career ladder. Where is Esau's danger, your danger, in this present situation, and where is it mine? Friends, how do we endure in the Christian life? How do we go the distance? How do we keep going when trial comes? God says to us by his word, consider Jesus. Submit to the Father's loving discipline. Choose the straight path and treasure your inheritance in Christ. Jonathan Griffiths here in Encounter the Truth and a message called Endurance. If you missed any part of the broadcast or you just want to listen again, come to EncounterTheTruth.org. You know, being a listener-supported ministry, we depend on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on the station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book called The Case for Christ. And if you're a regular listener, you know that we want to equip you with resources that will benefit you, that you can use in your walk with Christ. So, Jonathan, who would this book be beneficial for? Well, I think this is a book that will be useful really to any kind of listener to the program today, and that's one of the reasons we selected it. It'll be useful to you if you're exploring the Christian faith. Maybe you just happened upon the program today as you were flicking through the dial on the radio and, and you started listening, and maybe some questions are now springing to mind about the Christian message and the Christian faith. This book is an articulately argued case for Jesus being who he says he is in the Bible. And, and I think you're going to find it fascinating. I think you'll find it engaging. I think you'll find it hard to put down. So if you're exploring the faith, this book is for you. If you are a believer who wants to grow in your ability to engage in conversations about Christ with others who don't yet trust him and don't yet follow him, this book is going to be great for equipping and resourcing you for those key conversations. And if you're someone as a believer who's, who's praying for friends and loved ones and you're thinking, what, what could I do to be a help to them as they consider the faith or to, to help them even begin to consider the faith, this is a great book to get hold of and to prayerfully give away. Well, we'd love to send you a copy of this book, The Case for Christ, is our thank you for your financial support this month. You can give your gift online at EncounterTheTruth.org or over the phone. Our number is 833-998-7884. It might be easier to remember as 833-99-TRUTH. 
Or again, the website, EncounterTheTruth.org. For producer Mark Bretta and our Bible teacher Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.